We have a jam-packed schedule today, so we are going to ask that um, we either type your questions in the chat, and if my team can respond to them, then they will. Otherwise, we have a Q&A session um, at the end of it that you will be able to ask any question that you have and interact with our panel members. So, so this morning, um, we're going to have our Dean's welcome. We're going to kick it off with our Dean's welcome. Then we have a pre presentation by myself. Then we have um, the the indiv individualized development plan by Shyam Patel. And then we have our faculty members and successful scholars joining us for a panel discussion, and then we'll head into Q&A. Um, I think um, the agenda is also shared in the chat. We will also be distributing the slides in the, in the next couple of days, couple of weeks, um, depending on how long it takes us to compress the, these videos. Um, but we will, be dis we will be distributing it to the email address that you have signed up with. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Alice. Thank you so much, Ricolette, and thanks for putting together what looks like a fantastic agenda. So I just want to take a couple of minutes. I don't think it will take 10. Just first of all, to introduce myself. Hello, everyone. My name is Alice McLaughlin, and I am the Dean and Vice Provost of Graduate Studies here at York University. I also want to say what a pleasure and an honor it is to welcome each of you to this really fantastic workshop on Fostering Black Scholars Scholarship Success. Uh, so just for a little context for me and how I see this as the Dean of Graduate Studies here at York, I think it's crucial for each of you to realize that as graduate students, you are actually part of the largest body of researchers at York University. You make up a significant part of what research means at York. And that means that the scholarship and the research that you are doing right now, whether as master's students or doctoral students, plays a crucial role in our overall mission as a leading research institution in Canada. And so it's my pleasure to get to say as Dean, how proud we are of each and every one of you and how delighted we are that you're taking advantage of this workshop. All of us at Graduate Studies know the time, the effort, the diligence, the sheer willpower that goes into getting this far and into the ambitious plans that each of you had ahead of you, that each of you have for the research project ahead of you and for the research project that you are looking to support. We also know, because you are York graduate students, that the kind of work you will be doing is focused on some of the most difficult questions, concepts, and theoretical problems, or the most pressing and urgent practical problems of our time, whether looking at climate change and scientific innovation, social justice and the distribution of resources, new connections, opportunities, or insights for a better world. And that's all very wonderful, but let's be realistic. To be able to focus, you need support. Some of that comes from us, whether as top researchers, as your supervisors, facilities, spaces, resources, libraries, communities for learning, but also material support. And I hope that today you'll hear about a number of internal awards, scholarships, and funding opportunities. But I think part, a large part of our support for you at York comes in how we both connect and inform you, but also prepare you for external funding, for some of the top external funding in Canada. And I have to say, we have a really fantastic track record of doing this for Black scholars, largely thanks to the initiatives of Ricolette and her phenomenal team, who are going to take you through this today. But you should know that... Um, for example, the Vanier Award, one of the most prestigious graduate scholarships in Canada, York University has received 37 of these, and 22% of those were for Black scholars, ranging over CIHR, Vanier, and Shirk. We have earmarked an additional 10 Ontario graduate scholarships specifically for Black scholars this year, and um, of the earmarked CGSM scholarships for Black scholars, so those are um, Canada Graduate Scholarships at the Master's level and National um, Scholarship Award, we have received 25% of them in the 24-25 competition. So we see ourselves as sort of leading edge competitive in terms of how we um, attract and work with and support some of the best Black scholars in Canada. We know you are part of that and we're delighted to help prepare you for both internal and external funding today. So I hope that the workshop today serves you 
both in the specific tips and tricks you will receive for scholarship applications and for looking out for awards, but also more broadly in the opportunity to learn from and speak with leading researchers, folks who have been where you are today and have succeeded, just, that I, just as I have every faith that you will succeed. So from me as Dean, congratulations and good luck. Pay good attention today, learn lots, because I know that the kind of excellence that you already have, the kind of research project you have in mind, and the support and information you get today will carry you forward. And know that when you do this, you will be bringing with us, you will be bringing with you our faith in you and your work. So I, as I said, I don't wanna to take too much time. I wanna pass it over to Ricola and her team and just say, I'm so glad this workshop is happening and best of luck to all of you in your applications. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. So um, before I start, um, this wonderful team that we have who will, who will be your main source of support in, in our upcoming OGS Tri-Council um, competition, I just wanted to just let, in, let them introduce themselves so that you are aware of the name behind the face, the face behind the names that you will be communicating with. I'll first hand it over to Frank. Thanks, Rikla. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Frank, and I'm the scholarships and the work coordinator at Faculty of Graduate Studies. Uh, I will pass my microphone to Sudat. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Suzette Fernandez. I'm one of the research officers here at the Faculty of Graduate Studies. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Naruz. I'm also a research officer with the Faculty of Graduate Studies. And along with my colleagues, we're here to support you in any questions that you have regarding awards and scholarships. And of course, you have myself, Rick Lett Frackleton. I'm the Associate Director for Research Scholarship and Awards. Later on, we're going to be joined by our Associate Dean Tukumbo Ojo, as well as two, uh, two of our faculty members who I will leave to introduce themselves at that time, as well as three of our most successful Black, black scholars, um, just to give you guides, tips, encouragement, resources that will help you in your journey onwards. So. What we're gonna move on to um, just explaining some of the resources that you have, that we have here at um, York University, as well as how to go about achieving success. Okay, so I'm going to start by some of the smaller internal awards um, that are mainly with, um, you will find a lot of our awards on our website. Um, and you will find that some of our awards are with different um, operating units within the campus. So for example, CERLAC offers the Pavel and Eno Lucari fieldwork research. And this award is basically open to all our masters or PhD scholars um, here who are focusing on completing research activities, um, your academic training costs, um, field work, specialized equipment, software. And this is specifically for indigenous and or black scholars. Um, CERLAC is a great source of research resource. Um, so please get familiar with them, especially if um, you are looking, look, looking into doing research of any, um, sorry, with regards to indigenous and um, um, black um, resources. Uh, then we also have the fellowship portion of the Pavel and Lukari Award. That is a bigger amount. It's for ten, it's $10,000 and Surlac off, offers that um, to one student per year. Um, it is very helpful. It covers the similar costs as the scholarship but we expect that the students are registered in the Diploma for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, as well as that they demonstrate financial need. I'll also take this opportunity to let you know that um, our new award system has been launched and I encourage you to complete the, the student profile because this is what we will use to identify you and to assess um, your level of financial need. We also have the W.W. W. Anderson Award in Caribbean Studies, and this goes to students who identify as Afro-Caribbean or Black, who 
within CIRLAC again, and they are uh, they are a, they're aligned with the Caribbean or the Caribbean diaspora. This is one thousand dollars, and dependent on um, the income received from our donors, um, this value may change, or the number of awards may also change. We also have the Ra McGowan Memorial Scholarship, and this is open to students in the Faculty of Environmental Studies and Urban, Urban Change. And this covers um, most of your research activities. It is $1,000, um, but it will help to supplement um, your your fieldwork costs and associated, associated expenses. Um, it's open for students um, who can demonstrate academic excellence and also identifies as either Black or Indigenous. Um, a lot of the times we also ask for um, community leadership, um, experimental experience or volunteer experience. Um, that will help to strengthen your application. So as you go along, sometimes you'll recognize that we ask you for short personal statements that will that you will need to express how your research is aligned with the scholarship. Two years, uh, sorry, this is our second year. Two years ago, um, the Bennett family um, injected over $1 million in scholarship and awards to our grads and undergrad student. Within that um, endowment, we received um, what we have for the Bennett Family Graduate Scholarship for Black and Indigenous students for both our master's and our PhD students. And that gives us $20,000 for your first year. And if you're in, that's for master's student. And if you're in a program that exceeds past one year, so some of you may be in programs that's five terms or six terms, you can also be funded for those additional terms. Then uh, for our PhD students, students are then offered also $20,000, but you can get funded for up to four years of your studies. This is usually offered to our incoming students um, who demonstrate academic excellence and are and our Ontario residents, um, and we also look at financial need, which is another reason why we encourage you to complete our student financial profile. We also have in Lausanne the IBET. I call it IBET, but it's called the Indigenous and Black Engineering and Technology Momentum Fellowship. And this is valued at $30,000 per year. And you can receive this every year for up to four years of your degree. You will get it in the form of a research assistantship. And recipient, we look at students who have maintained um, satisfactory academic excellence and progress in their PhD program within, within Lausanne. We're gonna move on to the external funding opportunities that are available um, that my team and I are integral in help in collaborating, coordinating and administering that process. So first we'll look at the Ontario Graduate Scholarship. Like Rodine mentioned, we have earmarked 10 additional Ontario Graduate Scholarship for black and indigenous students. Um, this works out to be $15,000 per year for a maximum of one year. It is non-renewable, but you can reapply each year for up to two years at your master's and four years in your doctoral studies. We give out 10 per year. We look at incoming students. We look at our current students. And we basically take a look at your academic excellence, um, how, what your research will be focused on and um, any other attributes that may merit um, $15,000 per year. So in order to apply for this, you're going the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, you will either apply for that by itself or you would apply in addition to the Tri-Council Awards, um, which I'll go into a little bit. Going to further, we've had a few um, grant 
write in workshops geared towards short conductoral applicants. And we will also have a few more workshops in September and October for just to kick off your applications. So you can look out in the newsletter as well as on our calendar for the dates for that, as well as we will also be sending out targeted emails with the Zoom links so that you can attend and we will go more in depth into how to submit these applications and what the adjudicators will be looking for. So like I mentioned, um, in addition to the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, we expect that you apply for the tri Council Awards and tri Council is made up of three different research, er research areas. So CIHR, that's for the health research, and CERC for Natural Sciences and Engineering students, as well as SHRC for Social Science and Humanities um, students. So what you will, depending on the program that you're enrolled in, you will select the agency that you will apply to, and then you will submit your application externally to that agency, and then you will come on our internal application portal, which is the new financial aid and awards scholarship port portal, and submit an additional less complex, very short questionnaire that we will use to match your application with tri, with tri Council so that we can assess you also for the Ontario Graduate Scholarship. And we do that for both our doctoral and our master's students. So the main takeaway from this portion is that you will apply externally for your tri Council award and then apply internally by submitting a cover sheet for the Ontario Graduate Scholarship Award. So this year, Tri Council have increased the amount of their awards. Last year, it was forty thousand dollars. I mean, last year it was thirty-five thousand dollars per year, and you could, um, or twenty thousand dollars per year for Shirk Fellowship, and twenty-one thousand dollars per year for the PGSD in NSERC. So we've seen a huge increase. We and we ex we anticipate that we'll start for students for 24, 25 onwards. Um, this was announced in the last federal budget. And we may have students in here who will start their awards this year. Um, just a quick shout out and encouragement. Um, we will start making payments towards those um, for based on last year's uh, last year's amount at the beginning of September, about September 10th. From September 10th to September 30th, you will start seeing those amounts in your account. However, you will not be able to see the new amounts until later in the year because we have not received the funding for that portion. So um, I'm just giving you a heads up. You may see a different amount than we than we have listed here based on the revenue that we receive from the agencies. For our master's student, there we've seen an increase to $27,000. Last year, it was $17,500. So it's a significant jump and we highly encourage you to submit. If you're a master's student and you'll be returning next year, please submit your application for the tri Council Master's Award. We, it covers both SHRC, it covers SHRC and CERC and CHR. And you will, just like the doctoral portion, you will apply on the research portal externally and then come to submit your internal cover sheet through the new financial aid and award scholarship portal. In addition to the funding that we mentioned bef before, Budget 2022 announced an increase to the number and the proportion of awards that we will be available to our research trainees. And this will be sent directly to our funding agencies. Um, Alice, Alice mentioned briefly um, that we received 20% of the additional CGSM awards that were granted by the federal 
government. Um, and we expect to have the same track record um, in the next coming years. There is a $40.9 million expectation over the next five years. And we will see that in the form of different supplemental application and different types of applications. Um, we, we will see also changes to how the applications will be submitted um, and the eligibility criteria, as well as the duration of those awards. So um, stay tuned. Um, as soon as we receive additional information, we will be sending it out to our students. So like I mentioned before, there is a federal allocation specifically for Black students. Um, there's additional 20 for CGSM. This year we received four of that. Last year received five. Um, and this is nationally. So it's, it's good that the agency recognizes our researchers, um, especially, especially our um, Black researchers. There's also an expectation that Tri-Council awards will be streamlined. Um, we, we still have Vanier going, but it will only be for the next two to three years. And I hope we receive the Vanier applications from you. Um, the, the, the competition kicked off in June and that was for $50,000 per year. We will see a change in um, what that looks like over the next few years based on um, the federal budget announcement. And we expect that it will it will be similar um, in terms of academic merit, but it will take into consideration, it will take EDI into consideration. There's also the new Capstone Research Funding Organization that was recently announced, and as well as they've created an advisory council for science and innovation for for science and innovation strategies. So we have last year we introduced a self-identification questionnaire in our applications. This year with the new financial awards and scholarship portal, it's built into the system. So when you complete your student profile, we ask that you, you select um, your ethnicity because we use that information to determine your eligibility for specific awards. From time to time, donors come in and they ask for specific students or they want to fund specific areas of research. So we use that information specifically for that. We guarantee that your information will remain private. It is just to identify trends and provide rationals for any new initiative and case for supports that we that we put forward, as well as um, encourage the institution based on based on the demography and the statistics that we see, the demand that we see um, within the university. So to encourage funding to go to these areas and we've seen where this is helping um, at the at the institutional level and the federal level. At the federal level, the agencies have are committed to identifying and eliminating systemic biases. They are they have launched different um, un unconscious bias trainings, which we which we take our adjudicators through every four times per year. Um, they, the federal agency also asks you to provide information for their self-identification questionnaire, which drives where they direct the resource to for the additional scholarship, which I mentioned prior. Um, they will ask you about eight questions with re regards to your age, gender identity, sexual orientation, your indigenous identity, your visible minority status, what population group, or your disability or language. You also have the option to say that you prefer not to answer, or you can select which of those areas you choose to respond to. Just bear in mind that 
this information is used by them. The adjudicators at York do not see that piece of information. So when you submit it to Tri-Council, it is held only at Tri-Council. The piece that you submit here through the new system will be seen by us for our allocation. If you have any additional information about the Tri-Council policies around EDI, don't hesitate to visit CHR's website. There's a list of frequently asked questions, as well as their statement on what they will be using the resources for. So like I mentioned, you'll be seeing self-identification questionnaires at the university level, especially when we're looking at our scholarships and awards, and you will also see it at the Tri-Council level. The main takeaway message is that you complete this area because it tells us where we need to direct our resources to. And once the, once the funding is available, that is exactly where it will go. So without this information, we won't know what our students look like and who we should be directing the resources to. I'll also tell you a little bit about our own faculty of graduate studies support groups, some supports. So our next session will be held in conjunction with NSERC. They will be coming to the university and we will be co-hosting with them an info session. So all our students who are in the natural science um, focused area, please attend the workshop on September 10th. We will also have two Tri-Council doctoral and OGS application workshop where we will take you through the application process. You can come prepared, take a look at the website, take a look at the application and get your questions ready so that we are better able to answer them. We will have two sessions. So if you're not able to attend on the Thursday, please attend the following Wednesday. Register for the workshops. We will also provide you with links to, if we're able to, the recording. And for sure, we will be able to circulate the slides. But it's best that you attend because I find that there's a lot of knowledge that's provided in the Q&A section, but we do not record the Q&A section for privacy reasons. For a master's student, we're going to have the master's session in October. So the first one will be October 10th, and that will be on the Thursday. And just in case you're not available that Thursday, please attend the Tuesday session. I also encourage you to visit our awards website, take a look at the award search section, as well as the York internal awards section. For students who are interested in, in Tricons and other external awards, we have a few, we have awards from um, College of Ontario Universities. We have um, awards for autism scholarship. We have Ontario Women's Scholarship. There are a number of other resources that are provided there and we help to administer them or we are able to provide directions on how to go about it. We have a number of merit-based scholarships as well as our needs-based bursaries, which are dependent on your level of financial need. We also have or research support funds, which is the Academic Excellence Fund, which I'll tell you about in the next slide, as well as the Research Costs Fund for our students who are QP members. Note that most of these funding opportunities are open to our full-time graduate students. Um, I am pushing, I am making a case for support for our part-time students because we see that there is a demand for part-time scholarships and awards, but I, I can honestly say the funding in that area exists, but it's very limited. Um, so a lot of our awards are geared towards or full-time students who are, and of course you have to be registered active at the time of the application, as well as depending on what you're applying for. So if you're applying to attend, to present at a conference, then you need to be registered active at that time. So I'll jump into the Academic Excellence Fund because I, I find that more students are eligible for this than um, a lot of the other scholarships, which are a lot more competitive. So the Academic Excellence Fund is open to 
um, students who will be presenting their works at conference, disseminating information, um, putting on grad students activities, and also for professional development initiatives. There are specific eligibility criteria, but this is one of the few funds that's available to part to both part-time and full-time students in the master's and the doctoral at the master's and the doctoral level. Um, unfortunately, it is not available to the professional programs such as Osgood Professional Development Program or Schulich yeah. Masters. Um, students just because they also have their own private fund, but you can receive up to $2,000 per year for your individual research expenses or for, or an additional $300 for collective initiatives. So if you are a member of, say, the Grad Student Association or any of the membership groups on campus and you would like to um put on an event that encourages research, um, we are able to fund the organizers up to $300 per academic year. The academic year starts in September and ends August of the following year. And we have three competitions. So the, the next competition will be October 31st. Then we'll open for winter. And that competition will be February 29th. And the summer competition will be June 30. We usually adjudicate the awards about four to six weeks after comp completion. And we also ask that you have supervisor support. And if for any reason you will be working with human participants, we also ask that you receive ethics, ethics um, clearance before you embark on any research or before you apply for the Academic Excellence Fund. FGS and QP have bursaries available. Um, you will apply to these through the Financial Aid and Award Scholarship System. This is based purely on financial need. Um, there are no, there are no merit-based considerations for these bursaries. Um, Q, of course, if it's a QP bursary, you need to be a priority pool member for that year. Um, but for FGS bursary, it is um, we look at your financial needs. And we open that portal starting September 1, and we close January 31st. So that captures your registration status for both the fall and the winter term, and then we open another one at the beginning of May and close at the end of May for the summer session. We also offer resources to help you in your um, application process. So we offer a guide for a successful grant writing proposal. We also encourage um, you to provide your references with a guide on how to write successful reference letters. We have recordings for our past workshops and different agencies provide um, application procedures. So the one that we have listed here is created by NSERC, but it covers a lot of information for tri-agency. So um, we do encourage you to take advantage of that information, especially about now, start because applications are going to be open. Uh, we expect that the deadlines are that the deadlines are actually October. So you need to start your applications now. So take a look at the resources. Get get into that mode, get into that framework so that you're in a better space to start submitting those applications. So I'm going to, I'm sure you've heard a lot from me. I'm going to turn it over um, to Shayam Patel to take you through the individualized development plan and how it will support our Black scholars. Shayam, are you here? Yes, I'm right here. Okay, do you have a slide to share? I do. Perfect. Okay, um, I'm always nervous when there are um, folks from FTS that are um, witnessing my presentation, but it's nice to. Um, Know there are some colleagues here that I, I know uh, in some capacity, so that's always reassuring. I'm going to now attempt to share my screen. Um, I hope you're able to. Yes, we can. It. Okay, um, so I'm just going to need a little bit of help from everyone. Uh, 
those who are listening, but also folks who work at the FGS, you're welcome to um, partake as well at the very start. I have a few questions. And if you could put in the chat, um, if you feel the answer is yes, go ahead and say yes in the chat. If you um, feel no or maybe or other options, just just put whatever your your response is. So how many of you here um, sometimes feel confused, whether in the work you're doing or just in life in general? So if you resonate with that question, I would really appreciate uh, a yes, no, maybe, or whatever works for you. Not all at once, of course. <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you. Um, I, I see a couple of folks saying yes, or sometimes. Um, how many of you feel sometimes you uh, find yourself comparing to others and having potentially imposter syndrome? Yeah, quite a few people. And my last question, um, how many of you here predicted that JLo and Ben Affleck were not going to work out? Okay, a couple of folks. Um, I, I called it. I knew when it started. I'm like, girl, it's not going to last. Um, and I, I was right. Um, so jokes aside, the questions I posed, I think, we must all take seriously, even the last one. Pop culture is very much a part of my life and might be a part of yours. But the other two are feelings that I know a lot of students, graduate students in particular, feel at times. And that's not to say that we are only those feelings, but they do make up and consist a lot of what we experience in this journey. And so I'm here today to introduce a tool. But before I do, I'll just briefly introduce myself so you get context to who I am. Uh, so my name is Sham. Uh, my pronouns that I use are he, him, and I'm a doctoral student in the Faculty of Education. I just recently, um, not too long ago, submitted my research proposal and got it back with one minor revision. Yes, I am gloating. Um, I think that's worth sort of uh, showing off about, but I, I'm envisioning the finish line more and more. And I also this semester get to have the privilege to work with the Faculty of Graduate Studies as a graduate assistant. And so part of my role involves meeting other graduate students to talk about the Individualized Development Plan or IDP for short. So the IDP essentially is a tool that the FGS has created to support graduate students like all of us here with our goals during our studies, but also to think about our next steps in terms of what we want to do after graduate studies. And here I want to highlight that it would be to contemplate both thinking about what kind of opportunities exist within academia, but also beyond it as well. So very briefly, what the IDP is, it's a tool. It's, um, and I'll share the link to the website at the very end of this. There's a tool, it's, a, it's in the form of a PDF, where you sit down and think about where you are currently in your journey and what you might want to improve on or what sort of next steps that you want to continue on and then based on that you have this plan that's formulated that you work on throughout the time you're here at York University. Um, it can be something that is used to identify your academic and scholarly pursuits but also to think about other interests and passions that you might have as well. Now, when you go through the IDP, and this is something I encourage all graduate students to do. Um, some of you are friends, some of you are colleagues. So it's, it's a personal sort of recommendation I make here is you have to sit with the tool and start with a self-assessment. This is the big picture of where am I currently and what do I envision doing during this journey? The FGS has also to support that thinking develop six thematic areas 
that they have found are congruent to the needs of graduate students. So career exp exploration and planning, communication, health and wellness, managing time and resources, research dissemination, and teaching. And the idea is that you are assessing yourself and reflecting on these thematic areas and then pinpointing next steps accordingly. I like to give a personal example here because sometimes folks will feel, okay, this is a lot. Um, and my suggestion here is really to think about what thematic areas make sense for you. They could be all six, and obviously that is encouraged to think about all six, but you might find that you want to pay particular attention to some thematic areas more than others. And that's not to say some are less important. So I'll give an example to make sense of what I'm trying to gesture here. I personally, um, I'm going to age myself a little bit here. Um, I used to be an elementary school teacher. I always tell people I'm a teacher first and foremost, above all else. And I am stepping into my ninth TA ship. I was very fortunate during my master's to get several TA ships, uh, so teaching assistantships, while I was uh, at the University of Ottawa. And then I've had uh, one a year here at York. And so teaching might be an area where I feel more confident or I feel I have a lot more experience. So when I plan next steps, I might focus less on trying to look into teaching opportunities. Obviously, it is partially a lie. I love teaching. Um, and so I always come back to teaching and teaching kind of supports and trying to foster those. But I might pay more attention to research dissemination. Uh, many of you might resonate with this. I, in my um, research, pay particular attention to racial grief and trauma in K-12 education. And in some of my work, I have been met with um, some harsh criticism. And I, I always welcome feedback. But to be very honest, some of it has been really um, pointed towards racial dynamics, um, the use of terms that I find uh, might be outdated in describing someone's work. Um, I submitted a paper once that was uh, described as being schizophrenic. And so I share this because I know this is a constant struggle for me. And so I seek out opportunities and next steps that really support me in trying to make sense of how I articulate my, my research, how I might defend it, how I might be open to feedback, and so forth. So that's just an example I give to you in trying to make sense of how to maybe approach some of these areas if you do feel like it's a lot. Um, now, of course, there's the why should you take this up, right? You, you will hear a number of presentations over the course of the year. You have lots of things on your plate. Um, so the first thing is there is a certificate of completion. Now, I'm going to make this joke a little bit uh, cautiously, but I'll still make it because I, I think it's important to be uh, myself and truthful. Um, so apologies to the staff on the team. Um, but I share this with students all the time that um, I would be very surprised if you do the certificate and someone will look at your CVB like, damn, you completed the certificate of completion uh, for the IDP and we're going to now hire you. If that happens, please call me. Please call me. I will take you to lunch. I will uh, take back my words. Um, I do think the certificate is a nice to have, but I don't think it should be the only reason folks uh, pay attention to this particular tool. The reason I really think it makes sense is so that you have the opportunity to guide, guide and inform your trajectory as a graduate student and to make the most out of it. Um, that's, the, the, that's for me the real value in this offer is that you get to pinpoint what you want to work on. The other very important facet of the IDP is that you get to work on it or you should work on this with your supervisor, your graduate program director, or your a faculty mentor. And so the notion here is to get support from those folks in pinpointing opportunities and next steps that you might be looking into. And I think there's real value in that to um, have a team of people in your faculty who really support you in that regard. Um, so again, 
to reiterate, this is something that hopefully um, faculties will integrate. Many of you might uh, get to see me again in one of your program sessions where I come in to do a more detailed session around how I approach the IDP and workshop it with you and also welcome and invite questions during that session. Um, but truly, my suggestion here is you, you take a moment sometime in your week to examine and investigate the uh, resources that are on the IDP webpage. I will really point to a, a particular part in the, in the webpage called the GPPS. So the FGS has, I think, very brilliantly put together a set of resources. So when you're thinking about next steps and opportunities and you're unsure where to get started, that link in the webpage is one space where you can go. And I've used it. Uh, there was actually last week a boot camp. Uh, I know the term is a little bit interesting, but bear with it. Uh, it was a boot camp put on by Be Beyond the Professorate, where if you're thinking of careers beyond academia, um, and my understanding is um, FGS pays quite a bit for this specific program uh, where York University students have access to it. But it was wonderful. Like they did sessions on how to write a cover letter, how to do a CV, and they really go through it in detail with examples on ways to craft sentences that sometimes many of us just don't have the access to or might not have um, the background where, where we have members of our family or a uh, broader community who, who might be aware of how to navigate these things. So please do take a look at those, if anything at all. And finally, um, this is the link I'll put in the chat um, shortly that you can access. I want to make a note, I, I, my supervisor says this, I know I was joking at the beginning about JLo and Ben Affleck, but I, I think I also have a serious side. Um, and so my supervisor writes that the search for words is agonizing. And I concur with her that I think uh, as scholars, as teachers and writers, sometimes we struggle to find the words to convey. Um, and I think, at least personally, stringing up specific words can be quite painful, um, but also quite exhilarating at the same time. And I don't always know what to say to colleagues um, to offer sustenance. But if anything, um, my journey at York University has not been typical. In my first year, I was really thinking of leaving the program, um, having regrets about another offer I turned down. Um, and I came to the IDP to reflect, um, or a version of my own of it. And it really supported me in grounding myself. So whenever you're feeling like it is impossible, it can't. Your existence alone, I think many of you know, um, many of us were not supposed to be in these spaces. But here we are anyway, uh, because somebody said something at some point so that we can have access to these spaces as well. And I think it's incumbent on us to do the same for other students who come after us. So if there's any kind of hope that we're that we're trying to seek out, it's in each other. And it's in these resources that we might um, be offered to support us ever so slightly in making that journey a little more uh, gracious and productive for all of us. So thank you for having me. And if you see me on campus, please say hello. I look forward to getting to know you better. Thank you, Cheyenne. So um, we are going to hand it over to, to Combo. Hey, thank you, Ricky, and welcome everyone. So in the interest of time, I will jump it into what I have to say. But for the people that do not know me, my name is Tokumbo Joe. I'm the Associate Dean student in the Faculty of Grad Studies, and my own department is Department of Communication and Media Studies. I've been at York for 11 years, and it has been a pleasant journey. And to see initiatives such as this, it gladdens my heart. That being said, I only got eight minutes to talk about what is important when you're applying 
for scholarship when you're applying for grant. One thing that I would say from the get-go, and this is the elephant in the room, because I'm Black, do I need to do research relating to the Black community? The answer is no. So when you're applying, it doesn't actually have to be about Black research. So range of research matters. What is crucial is this. If you need to do the declaration, do it confidentially. But that being said, every successful application provide you foundation for the future application. Because on one hand, when you're successful on one, it's an indication to the larger community that your research is something that people value and it actually worth that investment. Likewise, the unsuccessful application, it's also a win for you because throughout that process, you've gone through defining the scope of your research, rewriting it, putting it out there for people to understand. Because it wasn't successful the first time, doesn't mean that it won't be successful the next time. Because always keep in mind, there are a lot of people competing. Just because you didn't make it the first time, doesn't mean you're a failure. The fact that you put it together means actually you're a winner. So keep that at the back of your mind. So for good application package, it require and it needs to show promise of academic excellency. Academic excellency could be defined in multiple ways. One, it could be through your grade. It could be through the community leadership also. It could be through service of volunteering in the community because this all ties together as part of the element of what you're doing. So academic excellence is not just defined by grade because people are also convinced of the fact that they are grade inflation. So as a result of that, it doesn't mean that everything needs to be solely based on grade. The other element that is also crucial in any successful application, which is the, no, the essence of it, your research proposal, it needs to be well-crafted. It needs to be well-defined. A broad and generic proposal will not get you far. But a well scope, well defined scope, areas of study will persuade people to give your research a look. Keep in mind, people that will be assessing your proposal, they come from different backgrounds. And if they stumble, when they are reading your proposal, it's difficult for them to pull it up either. Why? Because they have so many that they are reading through. But when it's well defined, they could understand it. You're already speaking to them, you are persuading them. So this is where the grandmother's rule comes in. I know in each field of studies, we all have our jargons that we use. When you're crafting your proposal, don't think about people in your field. Think about the larger community. Think about the large audience that might not be familiar. If you can explain your research today, it means something. Because part of the reason of doing research is to make contribution, is to make impact. What is also crucial? Eight what this research is all about and how it will be done and why it's important. So for instance, let's, let me use this framing. I want to do research on the black student at York. If you frame your research this way, it could be problematic. Let me just do the framing for you, this opening sentence. I we argue that more black students are coming to York because of the York social justice orientation. That's one frame. 
On the other hand, I could also frame it this way. I will prove York has more diversified student body. Those two framing of that research already raise question in the mind of the individual reading it. Why? You've not done the research, but you already come to conclusion by the first framing. I will argue more black people are coming to York based on social justice orientation of York. That basically is saying to the individual that you are going there to do the research to prove a point that you already concluded upon. Research is supposed to develop or discover new ideas. But if on the other hand, the same research project, you frame it this way, using survey questionnaire, focus group, I will examine why many black students are going to York University. That's neutral landing, but it shows them two things. One, you identify right away research method. You are examining. You are not predetermined at the beginning what your conclusion will be. And that opened the door for the individual to follow you all along. Likewise, in terms of defining the scope and the opening, how you grant this theoretically, it's also important. And how you also situate it in the body of literature, it's also important. Many will scratch their head when you, you know, frame it this way in the body of literature, where there have not been any study that has been done relating to the Black student experience at York. There has not been any study done relating to the Black student experience in higher education. Mine will be the first one, and it will be the groundbreaking. Why often, it's always good to say that, it's also problematic. Because again, we've not been exposed to all the knowledge. There are other literatures out there, but they might take a different approach. So one way of you also situating it in the body of literature is actually showing the nuance and the perspective that you will be engaging with. As opposed to be saying this is the unique, you could actually argue this will contribute to the existing literature around the Black student experience in higher education. And my research is situated in this institution for this reason. One, you could always argue saying in the Toronto area or the GTA area, there are X number of Black population. And you're trying to understand why they choose York. That also land quite well with the individual that is assessing this on the level of seeing what is new, what is unique in how you frame your research. Point number two that you also keep in mind when you are putting your package together. I can talk more and more on the framing, but in the interest of time, I'm gradually moving on. Reference later. It's all is important to seek reference later from the people that are familiar with your work, people that have read your research statement. Don't unpick any individual because if they can speak to that research, it's problematic. If they just write generic letter, you might not get the right score on that level. So how do you work? with people that will be writing reference later. This is why you reading through the terms of and condition of the grant scholarship you are applying for. Highlighting things, starting the crafting of your proposal months ahead, connecting with the individual, showing them draft. If you don't have the final draft, give it enough time having conversation with them to see if they can speak about your research in relationship to the terms and the condition of that scholarship or the grant that you are applying for. 
to also prepare them, give them your CV, show what you've done over the course of years, and give it a reasonable time period. So if the grant or the application is due September 15, ideally, it's always good to give them at least three weeks. Don't send it to them 48 hours before. Because if you send it to them 48 hours before, two things can happen. One, they are busy. They just use the boilerplate, reference letter, not getting in-depth. But if you give them enough time, if they have questions, they can work with you. They might will show you, I've done that with my student, showing them the reference letter because reference letter also add value to your scholarship application. What is also quite important is how you also do the final submission. So what can number of students wait until 24 hours before or two minutes before it closes? You might have the best application, but if you can't load it in, there is a problem there because going through the manual process and everything, things could be lost. Format of that PDF or the Word document could be changed around. Yes, these are little things that you have under your control, but these are crucial elements. But without taking so much time, I've reached my eight minutes. I will stop and I'll be more than happy to speak more, to answer more questions later on in the panel and a session. So thank you. Thank you, Takambo. So we're going to go on next to Dr. Solomon Bulki Yedam. Are you here? Perfect. Yes, I am. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Philemon Bulki Yedam. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank FGS and uh, the organizers of this uh, meeting is awesome. I think it's the first time I'm seeing this. So uh, kudos to the uh, initiators of this uh, meeting. And, and thanks to all those who are sending the emails. I do appreciate their time uh, doing it. So I'm an associate prof at the mechanical engineering department. Um, and I do research on uh, advanced manufacturing and material science. Uh, those are my specialties. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, what to talk about, but hey, it's awesome. Scholarships, right? You know, it's. I think it's something that uh, Professor Ojo has said almost everything that I wanted to say. So it would be very hard to add a new uh, thing to it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I want to come at it from the perspective of NSEC, right? Or let's say the sciences, okay? Uh, and um, I've been privileged to be on a few of the review committees for the uh, NSEC, um, awards and uh, I just want to uh, bring some of the things that I've observed on the review okay so typically uh, I've seen that for those in the sciences the the focus has been a little bit more on um, uh, publications okay in this case whether it's a conference or whether it's a journal or anything like that uh, those has been some of the uh, main things that, the team actually looks at, you know. So they they, 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 they they send us the files and then they ask us to review and then, you know, make selections of 20% of the applicants. And then you realize that when we meet for discussions, the whole thing is centered first on the publication record of the student, uh, just to see whether they've attended some conferences, they have published some journal papers um, in their past work, right? Especially for those at the uh, PhD, and then, you know, postdocs, right? And if you are a master's student and you have a publication, that's even uh, better. It's like an awesome... Uh, uh, so for the sciences, uh, NSEC has been, uh, uh, you know, talking about those kind of uh, things. Now, the, then the second thing is on the uh, quality of the proposal, right? And um, the funny thing that happened in our previous review, for the most recent one, I realized that there was a particular applicant, you know, who was really successful. And there were two people who were like at the same level. And the only thing that I saw that distinguished between the two of them was one had a proposal that had a diagram in it. 
okay, a schematic. So you can actually think of this as a simple picture as part of a proposal was, uh, because these two applicants are on the same level, you know, the proposals are all well written and all of that. But because this person included a picture that spoke about the work that they were gonna be doing in the proposal, it was really a good thing, you know, to um, uh, distinguish himself from the other applicant. So if you have the chance to go for a conference, please do. If you have the chance to pre present your work somewhere, please do. If you wanna publish your work, please do, because these are things that will open a lot of doors for you when you're applying for some of these scholarships and grants. Of course, the A pluses are important, right? Uh, but again, it seems almost all the applicants have A plus, so you know, it's, it's not something that is uh, very special. Then it comes to the presentations, the conferences, the quality of the proposal, and you know, that's one of those things that I've seen. Now, on the other side, in terms of the community engagement, right? So um, I remember there was an applicant who was involved extensively in the mentoring of high school students, okay? And then this distinguished this applicant from all the others because they've been involved with trying to mentor the next generation of scientists, you know, going from the high school level. And you can actually see the level of involvement that they've been doing. All right. So it was also a very good um, observation that I've been seeing. Now, it means that if you have the opportunity to volunteer for some of these activities, please do. If you have the opportunity to even um, start something uh, that's, that will benefit uh, your team, benefit um, the, uh, those in high school, those in undergrad, it's awesome because it's actually going to pave a way um, to demonstrate how you are willing to mentor the next generation of scientists, right? So volunteer uh, works are actually very, very, very important, right? And of course, reference letters. So I've seen it so many times when students send me, um, can you please write a reference letter for me? I was in your class, you know? Then I'm thinking, the fact that this person is even telling me that they were in my class and I can't identify them, it means that I'm not quite sure what to write in terms of the references, right? So if you want a prof to give you a, ref a good reference letter, be, 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 let the prof know you. Go talk to them, all right? Let them know what you are doing. You know, um, you, can, you can invite them to some of your presentations, whatever it is, because you know that you might want a reference letter from this prof, okay? Just as Professor Ojo was saying, if I don't know your work, I'm very, like, I'm not really, really sure how I'm going to write something nice about or something compelling for you. You know, and you can tell me, oh, I do this and that and that, but because I'm not somebody who really knows the kind of work you are doing, it becomes a challenge in terms of writing a compelling reference letter for you. So it's one of the things that uh, I would say uh, we pay we pay attention to, and then following the instructions of the application. Okay, so every one of these scholarships they have specific instructions that people have to follow. Okay. You can be the top student with all the publications. Sometimes just not following the instructions alone can actually take you out. I've seen it, um, some applications where sections were left uh, unfilled. There was nothing there in those sections. And then you are wondering, this is a very smart person. You know, they, they have all the qualities to get this grant, but because of just omitting some parts of the application process, that said it takes them out, right? So. Uh, make sure you are following the process in terms of the requirement for writing these things, and then um, you are getting the things that you are supposed to do uh, on point. Now, the other thing that I have also seen is just the whole presentation. Okay, so the, the some some scholarships are nice. They're going to tell you that we want to see this first, and that, and that, and that. But some of them is just open ended, and so we are looking at the quality of the presented materials. And when I say the quality, I'm referring to the, 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 the font sizes you are using, right? Even the, the kind of grammar that is going on in there, right? The, the quality of the communication, right? Because sometimes in the review part, we talk about um, the quality of the applicant as a researcher, and then also the quality of the presented material. So if you are not paying attention to the quality of the material that you are presenting, that can actually go against you in terms of how you are able to communicate your things to um, other people. 
And then with the writing of the proposal itself, well, I'm from engineering. So when somebody is talking about focus group, all these kind of things, and I'm thinking, okay, what is all of this, you know? So if you are not using a language that the reviewers can actually understand, even though you might have an awesome thing, that might actually be uh, put you at a, at a disadvantage, right? And so that's one of the things you pay attention to in terms of the proposal has to be in a language that non-technical people can also understand because the reviewers are made up of people from different backgrounds, okay? So these are things that I would say uh, we'll be paying attention to when, when we have the opportunity to uh, apply. And one last thing, apply. I can actually confidently tell you that people don't apply, okay? And I remember when I was in um, when I was doing my grad uh, studies, I, I got an award of five thousand, and I met one of the people who was in the committee. He's like, okay, nobody applied. You were the only applicant. That's why you got it. Hey, you know. So sometimes you realize that people do not put in the application. That's all. All right. And you taking the time to prepare the application even gives you a perspective. Okay, what is my research going to be about? How is my research going to benefit people? So it helps you to think about your research. You do a form of you know, introspection of the thing you are even planning on doing and how to communicate that to people, how to really know the benefit of the research to other people. So these are things that I would say we should at least pay attention to, but if the tab is open for you, just put in the application. And I know that you know things are gonna be awesome. All right, I'll pause here and uh, we'll continue uh, with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are going next to Dr. Damidolo Adebayo. All right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to be part of this event. I have often wondered uh, whenever, uh, and this is more generally speaking now, whenever uh, successful people are asked to he explain uh, the reasons why they've been so successful in their various fields of endeavor. And they tend to say the same thing over and over again. They tend to give similar advices. And most times the advice they give seem to be common sense, seem to be too simple, too basic. And I say that because I am also going to reiterate uh, some of the points that uh, uh, Dr. Stokumbo Joe and uh, also Solomon have, have, have mentioned so far uh, in their own presentations as well. Now, uh, I think that uh, my case is slightly different in the sense that I have never studied in Canada, right? So I did not do my PhD in Canada. I did my PhD in the United Kingdom. Uh, I also did my master's in Europe, in mainland Europe. Uh, but Despite that, I've been an international student in all of these places, and I have been able to win uh, diverse awards, funding, fellowships, prizes, uh, both in Europe, the UK, and as well as in the United States. And I've had the privilege of mentoring uh, graduate students to win awards here in Canada. And the reason I say this, all of this, is not to brag or anything. It's just to say that while the rules uh, would vary from country to country and from awards to awards, uh, the principles of success uh, are essentially the same anywhere you go. So for instance, we know that uh, uh, Dr. Tukumbo emphasized just now in the comment session that for some awards, even using the wrong paper margin can disqualify you, something like that. Uh, that's a rule that might not be applicable elsewhere, but the, as underlining principle, uh, the principles are essentially the same. And uh, I just want to sh share within a few minutes, I might not take more than five to six minutes uh, maximum, uh, but I want to share like six of those principles that I think uh, they overlap nicely with everything that has been said so far. Uh, but I just want to emphasize them as short bullet point principles. And I hope that you remember at least a few of them. And the first one, the number one principle that I'd like to share is for you to never write yourself off. Never write yourself off. 
Uh, and that's the last point that Solomon made. If you don't apply, you've lost the opportunity already. That's the last point that was made. Uh, when you're starting out, when you're, uh, and this, what I'm about to say now applies more to uh, maybe graduate students in their first years or those that are still in the early stages of their research. When you're starting out, the process matters more than the outcome. At the beginning, right? The process matters way more than the outcome. So in other words, even if you apply for opportunities and you lose them, always ensure that you've learned something. Uh, so for instance, uh, it's, it's I'm still making the same point, never write yourself off. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this is because if you don't apply, you've lost. And so it's more important for you to always apply, even if you think you're not ready. I think that for me, it's because the process matters more, just apply, even if you think you're not ready. Uh, if you're like in the first or second year, you feel like maybe you're not ready for the Venice scholarship or for a shirk doctoral scholarship or for the OGS, just apply. Because the process of applying matters way more, right? So please don't write yourself off. Just apply and make sure that you're learning in the process. Uh, and this leads me to the second point, because the earlier you start applying, the earlier your weaknesses are revealed and fixed. The earlier you start applying, the earlier your weaknesses are revealed and fixed. This is why you cannot afford to write yourself off. This is why you must understand that the process matters. Because if you don't start early, say for instance, you're, you're, do, you're making your first major step in your third year. And then you realize that, oh, I don't even know how to communicate my research to a multidisciplinary audience outside of uh, the team of three or four members of my committee. Or uh, you realize that you cannot pitch the significance of your work uh, beyond the narrow scope, beyond the narrow uh, audience that you're primarily serving. Uh, so applying for this kind of, uh, uh, applying for various scholarships would usually enable you to, there are always questions in various forms across various shades and forms asking for the significance of your work. Right. So you are able to identify the weakness of your work. Is it that, oh, I can't communicate clearly in writing beyond my audience or I'm using too much jargons that people outside my field will not understand? And also there is the question of uh, for scholarships requiring leadership of service, for instance, if you're in your first year and you're applying for a major scholarship and they are asking you to describe your your uh leadership experience or volunteer experience and you realize you don't have them you can easily correct you can easily fix that problem within the next two years but if you are starting out in the third or fourth year then the pressure is a lot the pressure is much more you feel under you feel more tense obviously if you're already in that state uh you can always start at any time. The best time to, to make a decision might be 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, the next best time is now. That's that's what they say. Uh, and another weakness that you quickly discover if you start early is, for instance, uh, a major question is how easy can you assemble a team of referees to write letters for you? How easy can you? For instance, if you see an opportunity, say, uh, that is closing in three weeks and you're just hearing about it today, maybe because you've not been reading your emails, is it possible for you to assemble a team of, if they're asking for three referees who can write solid letters for you because they know your work? If you cannot, then it's also a weakness that we all need to fix. Again, these are underlying principles that would enable you to uh, be competitive and win more stuff over uh over time and these principles don't just apply to graduate students they apply to everyone right uh so how fast can i assemble a team of referees if i need to apply for something it's indicative of my own network it's indicative of my own strengths and it's also indicative of uh uh how people perceive my research right then the third point is Understand why you need to apply for funding and awards and stuff. Understand why. Uh, don't just apply because, oh, yeah, it's good to have it on the CV. It's more than it's good to have it on the CV. This is critical. For instance, if you're a graduate student interested in an academic career, uh, Dr. Tokumbo Ojo made an important point that I would like to reiterate. If someone gives you money, they're basically putting 
their money where their mouth is. They're basically saying, your idea is good enough for me to commit my funding. That's what they're saying. So it's more like a stamp of approval, no matter how subjective it might be. It's more like a stamp of approval on your research. So the amount doesn't matter. I mean, sometimes some funding applications, and I've had one or two graduate students, I don't think is it. you need to fill out for $500 is almost the same thing as this, the essays and the points you need to write for $5,000. Like, so sometimes the, the, the process of applying just is just too stressful and all of that and all of that. But I'm like, no, the amount doesn't matter because it's a stamp of approval. And the point has already been made and I would like to repeat it. It's that the more you win, the more you win, really. I mean, it's, that, it sounds repetitive, but it's true. Uh, when you win uh, your first one, it sort of paste, paves the way for the second. By the time you have a list of 10 different uh, fonts on your CV, you yourself, you know, you've mastered various methods that don't work and you know what to do for the next one, really. So the funding doesn't matter, really, for the amount, rather, doesn't matter. It's the process. It's, it's if you're a graduate student interested in academic career, you understand that the funding indicates that you also have significant communication skills and uh as someone once mentioned uh past funding history is indicative of future performance so in other words if you're when you get to, towards the end of your phd as a black student and you're looking for faculty positions such committees actually think that uh if you've been able to win a lot of money in grad school, then and if you've been able to win major prizes like Venny in grad school, then you would bring in money to the institution. And trust me, academia, I learned this lesson thankfully early, but academia is, I mean, research is important, but money is critical when it comes to funding the research itself. So if you cannot bring in money to your university, wherever you'd work, you are not really considered seriously uh, uh such committees would rather consider someone who has a demonstrated history of doing good research and bringing a lot of money to their institution because it also boosts institutional ranking it boosts all of those things so applying for funding and I'm, I'm winning them as a black graduate student is that who is interested in a professorial career is actually a matter of life and death that's why you have to understand the why so I'm not just applying because it looks good on the CV. I am applying because I need this to open the door to the next stage of my professional career. And for those that are not interested in academic careers, funding histories can also be pitched as uh, critical fundraising skills uh, for non-academic positions. And uh, the fourth point, and I'll just, I'll then shortly, at the fourth point, the fourth point, and I speak as a historian now, uh, as a scholar of the humanities and social sciences, uh, writing is thinking. Writing, you're not thinking when you're sitting down and meditating. The thinking process is actually when you pick up the pen or when you open your notepad or you bring out your keyboard or your typewriter, or whatever you use, when you put words on paper, that's when thinking really, really begins. Because when, you, when you're writing and rewriting your research statement and ideas to meet the requirements of the various internal and external funding bodies, the process is intellectually tasking. And understanding how to express yourself across multiple formats actually enables you to think about your research in new ways. And it also stretches the mind and allows you to see your projects in ways you would never have previously imagined. And it is also important for you to be able to describe your research in 100 words, in 200 words, in 300 words, in 5,000 words. Like you should be able to say the same thing in 10 pages and be able to say the same thing in one paragraph, right? So that process is intellectually tasking, right? And it enables you to have more finite ways as well as more flexible and malleable ways of like presenting your own work. So the more you apply for stuff, the more you even understand your own work better to the point where you can explain it to almost everyone. You can explain it to a technical audience. You can explain it to a non-technical audience. I mean, you can explain it to a mixed audience. The ability to do that is a critical skill that you learn by actually applying for things. And uh, the fifth point that I want to make, and this one is for those who have won, who have won, who have like 
a good list of uh, awards and funding in their CV already. There is no such thing as having too much money. If you want something, if you have a CV that, 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 if, if you, if you think, well, my funding history is decent, my award is, no, it's not decent, trust me. There is no such thing as having too much money. Please note this. Uh, sometimes some people feel like, well, uh, I have applied for something and I can reapply again next year, but I won it already last year. So let me give someone else an opportunity to, to win it. I think that mindset is naive in many ways because that's not how institutions think, right? Uh, and also, if you think, oh, I already have, for instance, $10,000, my research only costs $9,000. So uh, I don't need more money. Then it's a failure on your part to imagine possibilities for your own research. I mean, for instance, there are moments where in grad school that, I tell people that I've had to design ideas around funding opportunities. I've had to design. So for instance, like I see a funding opportunity for $5,000. I don't have, I don't have an idea that I don't have something I want to execute at that point in time. But then I start to think, what else can I do with my research that would win me this money? So let's take an example. For instance, you're working on uh, a project and I'll use an humanities example. Say you're doing research that involves field work in one country. Have you thought of other ways to publicize your ideas? Have you thought of other ways to publicize your results beyond publishing in journals and articles? Have you considered, for instance, making a, a, doing a project website? You know, something that you would never have imagined in your pro project proposal when you started. Seeing funding calls can stretch your mind. So if you think, oh, I have enough money already, I don't need to apply then it demonstrates that you're not thinking a lot about your work. And unfortunately, it's going to haunt you in the future. And I say this because I am affected, slightly affected by this now. So I have an idea that I'm preaching for a grant that I'm applying for. And uh, it's something that I have done on a smaller scale. But then uh, one of my reviewers told me that, oh, uh, you need to actually just go bring the evidence that you've done this before so that, and I was pitching to do like a small documentary. Oh, if you've not done it before, they might not want to like uh, take it seriously. So you need to show that you've done it before. So now I have to go bring that evidence from where it is. But the point I'm trying to make is if if you've done like a small five minutes video description of your work that was funded by uh, some money that you weren't thinking about during grad school, it opens up diverse KMB aspect of your future application. So for instance, you can you can boldly claim I've done many knowledge mobilization projects and I'm using knowledge mobilization for people that would work in shirk, uh, shirk most shirk based applications in the future. So there is no such thing as having too much money, please. And the final point is uh, the point that I started with, uh, but I want to emphasize more please cultivate good relationships with your professors and advisors and uh, people in your field. Cultivate a good relationship with potential referees. I mean, direct, mutually beneficial relationships that are not like you're just using people. Uh, because it's important to actually have more referees than you need for applications. For instance, if I need to apply for something due in two months and I only have three people and one of them is extremely busy, I can't force them to do it for me. So it's important for me to have four or five people that can do the same thing because they know my work. And trust me, if someone has written a letter for you before and they know your work, they just need to modify the letter or edit it or revise it or rewrite it for the next thing. It's easier. And I speak as a faculty member. It's easier for me to write reference letters for my students when I've written it before. Then for me, the first, when a new student is asking me to write a letter and I know their work well, I know them well. And because I always ensure that my letters are specific, they're not generic, they're not generic, they're tailored. The first letter is always a big ask. I'm like, oh God, I have to do this again. Because I, I want to start from the scratch. But when the same person is coming back to me, it's so easy within an hour or two hours, I can easily substitute stuff. I can move things around. I can rethink 
new projects that can rethink new aspects. And the more they advance in their work, the more they keep me up to date, it's easier for me to say more stuff about their work. And that can only be done through proper relationships and networking uh, that is sustained over time. And I said, I'm emphasizing this because there are some of us that are not very good at doing that. And it's also something that often affects black students generally when they're in these spaces and you know, the, the, you're sometimes unsure whether someone's going to attend to you properly when you want to introduce yourself to them. Just try, just do it, really. Uh, it's really important to have people on your side because no matter how good your ideas are, if there is no one to speak for you, sometimes you might just lose that opportunity. So quick recap, uh, never write yourself up. Never write yourself up. The earlier you start, the earlier you uh, you know your weaknesses and you're able to fix them. Understand why you need to apply for funding, whether you're in, interested in an academic career or you're not. Uh, writing is thinking. So the, the process of actually applying for things helps to clarify your ideas, uh, gives you more insight into your work. There is no such thing as having too much money. Uh, oftentimes, it's a failure on your path to imagine aspects of your work that can be expanded and uh, cultivate a good relationship with your referees so that you can always have people to reach out to even when the deadlines are tight. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I love our faculty members are just dropping knowledge. <laughs> We're so strapped for time. I wish I had booked way more time for this because it's just it's just so many gems. But I'm going to um, hand it over to our students um, who have been very successful in um, receiving a lot of these awards that we uh, that we've talked about today. And I just want them to give quick tips, tricks, guides, what helped them. And um, just, just bearing time in mind, because I also want to allow our students or audience members to ask questions. So here, it, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, <clears throat> it's lovely uh, being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, there's been like some really amazing gems, like you said, who uh, that have been uh, like, repeating a lot of what I was going to say, so it's great, especially since I'm coming to you as an accidental academic. It's really, <laughs> I, I still see myself as that. It's not really what I'm trying to be. I'm just trying to be me in the world, uh, coming from a family of immigrants and like parents who only completed high school, who don't speak colonial languages. And so um I, I'm bringing this up because my introduction to academia was undergrad at McGill and it was a nightmare. It took away my love for language and for knowledge and education and, and impacted my GPA. And so, because, so it was really low. I never thought I'd, you know, continue with education, higher education. It was done. Um, and fast forward to 18 years later, like in those years, I continued doing my work as a reproductive and disability justice work. And so it's actually my work as a activist, as an organizer that brought me to academia to do the research and document the stories of the communities and the marginalized and vulnerable people that I wanted to serve. And, um, and so though those 20 years of experience have actually made a big difference when I'm applying for um, awards. And I think I've received, I think close to 20 awards since 2019. And not because of my grade <laughs> only, um, but because the work that I did, the activism, the, the issue that actually mattered to me ended up um, demonstrating a certain expertise right? Credibility and authentic. And so when you're reading my application versus another person, it's just, that's just a theoretical exploration versus mine that comes from the grassroots, you know, it's, it's that little thing that can make a difference in terms of like, do you actually sound like, you know, what you're talking about, right? Um, but then when I did my master's um, in environmental studies, I learned from my lesson from McGill of like, well, you can do three jobs 
you know, take care of family and all of this. You, if you need an A class to be able to qualify for these awards, that has to be your priority. And so your life has to be centered differently. And so that lesson really shaped and prepped me for the PhD, which again, I wasn't planning on doing, but that focus on building my grade and raising my GPA um, allowed me to be eligible for these awards because I had to shift. Like I can't be hustling and still qualify. Like I had to kind of like make the choice. Um, and the third part that I wanted to touch on is doing these application process concretely as a student with invisible disability. And I um, want to give some like kind of concrete strategies on like actually how, how to do these applications and in a sense that it's really painful, right? And what does it mean to actually listen to your body? And because there's such a short term turn around um, in the application process. And if you have triggers or if you have flare ups that require downtime and coming back, the application, the competitions don't really provide space for that. And so part of the learning that I had to do was really like listening to my body, understanding my stressors and putting uh, a plan to support what is it that I needed in order to be able to fill out this, um, these applications. And part of that was really like, well, summertime is like full-time work in terms of writing grants. So we look at the, um, yeah. So if I had to actually like, really just like, I can't do any other job if I'm gonna do this because I need downtime and I need the back and forth if I could only do a few hours a day kind of thing. Um, and uh, so so that's what, so listening to your body, understanding your stressors, learning how to work with them. Um, and that means having your therapist, having your physical therapist, making sure that's part of your application process. Like you're the project management for your life. Um, so that, and again, writing these, uh, applications need, can't do it alone. So I have been lucky enough that I've had like, um, uh, well, the people that are really, um, whose, whose expertise I really value are peers in the community. Right. Um, and so I make sure to what I'm writing, the ideas that I'm presenting, is this is this real? Am I reflecting? Can you read it? So um, so for non-academics to read it and like this does it sound okay? And um and then you have the academic friends who are just like, well I can't get people to write the full to read the full application because it could be very um difficult and time consuming, people don't really have that. So one of the strategy was just like, okay, different sections for different people based on what they bring to the table. So th that was actually really, really helpful because um, it people could do it, deliver it in like a short term turnaround that they were able to do that. Um, what else could I say? Uh, yeah, so when you're asking for help from people with the editing process, be specific about what you're looking for. Like, you need, do you need a copy editor? Do you need someone with content? Because you have to keep going back to these people for different things. And so um, uh, really respect and value and treasure these support systems because you really, really, really can't do it alone, I think, um, especially yeah, if, as you're trying to do life and if you're part of that sandwich generation, you have the kids, you have the parents, you're trying to take care of everyone. It just makes it a little bit harder. Um, and lastly, one of the things that doesn't actually m make 
sense or isn't clear cut is I remember getting like really high score for sure when it comes to my expertise and uh, experience, sorry. Um, and then that same section, I had a low score during the Vanity application. I'm, I'm the same person. <laughs> And I know enough of myself and of the work that I do that it's for the level that I'm in, uh, right now I'm at, at doing my third year PhD, that it's actually quite significant what I've been able to accomplish. And so I don't, I don't know why they scored it low. I don't know what it would take to get a higher score. So something that seems quite obvious ended up being uh, an issue that had an impact on my ability to get funding. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that for Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna move next to Samson. Hi everyone. Uh thanks and uh yeah, I think uh, I know a few faces here, so but I'll try and uh, you know. Hopefully, you can hear me. I'm, as, I'm assuming I'm not talking to myself, so that's. Oh, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I at this point a lot have been said already, and it's almost difficult to get involved and try and think about what is it that hasn't been said for over almost two going to two hours now that I can, you know, uh, 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 try and uh, tell, uh, sorry, make an input that will make any difference. But uh, it's not so much about difference, uh, making a difference about just adding to what, uh, sorry, saying some things that has been said, uh, but perhaps in, in the process, I may be adding one or two things. Uh, what I would say, uh, something that, uh, Tukumbo himself has said, uh, uh, sorry, for, for I, 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 I use the word Tukumbo just because of, and I'll put that in a different context, but I'll use the word for you, for everyone's case, Dr. Tukumbo Ojo here. Um, I will say that for people who are looking into applying for, you know, grants, uh, we've talked about, you know, uh, seeking referees and so on. Uh, these are critical areas that you may want to think about how you will go through it, right? Uh, because some of the challenges we have, and I often I, I say this nowadays, is that uh, because of the nature of the digital space, uh, we in-person uh, relationship is so different nowadays, or people don't don't know how to relate in an in-person space and engage with in one-on-one -on -one, uh, with other people. Uh, maybe uh, the relationship will similarly involve into the non-human contact space and we may accept that that is just the new norms. Uh, but typically for what it were is that the in-person in engagement and the ability to engage in, with people, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, makes it much easier uh, for both not just your personality to show off with you and the person who you're trying to uh, seek referees from. Obviously, uh, part of that is the type of communication you have with that referee uh, when you are in, the, if you're thinking about this process, or sometimes you're not. Like for me, for example, I wasn't thinking about doing my PhD. I was going to end with my master's degree and, and that's it. COVID kind of changed that for me. Uh, because my wife were a partner works and we have a child and you know she makes more money. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take the default, leave my job. That's okay. Uh, so it was an easy, you know, a decision I had to make. But then it occurred to me, you know what? I did say maybe 10 years ago I want to do my how you plan to do PhD. So now let me go back and do the uh, do the PhD. But the easier thing is that at that time it gives me the room to uh put in my application. So I actually got my uh uh, 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 you know, approved before I came into the program. So I came with it into the program, actually. Uh, so, but it's not the first time that I have actually applied for shock. Uh, when I, I said I wasn't in PA, interested in PhD, but I did apply when I finished my master's uh, to see, if, you know, if I get it, I, you know, do the PhD, whatever. 
Uh, but at that point, I didn't get it. And I will explain why. Part of the reason is that sometimes some of the advice you get in here, uh, we have this sort of cognitive dissonance that, you know, does happen with us, right? We want to, we're so strict in our ways that we don't want to change the manner or what we're hearing. And when I was doing my application, I'm coming out of my MA. I'm thinking about technical writing, everything, you know, just all over my head. That's all I'm interested in. What is every advice I'm getting? Come on, those are garbage. Just all those nonsense words. You know, you, you're not advising me. That doesn't make sense. This is all I've been doing in my education, technical writing. And you want me to write things as simple, simplistic, as simple as, it just didn't resonate with me. It just didn't make any sense. And I remember I didn't get it. Well, I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, I use all kinds of world governmentality, this and this, I never really, you know. And the truth is, whoever is reading those things, and most people who are uh, the vigilators, they may not understand whatever I'm saying. Uh, because you have very limited word, and even if you have enough word means, uh, space, it means you're actually writing a whole paper, and typically you have a limited amount of words, pages that you have to abide by. Those were things which, for me at that point in time, it didn't work. This time around, I got the same advice from the same person, and that was before when I applied for, for the second application, and I was like, you know what? It does. I think it, it makes sense to follow who have actually received it in the past, who is advising you that just write A, B, C, D, rather than go like, I want to write A, B, C, D. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so I just you know write it. You know, this is Sam. Uh, this is what I'm doing. And yes, you know, explain the methodology. Which you've all talked about that before already. Uh, you know, what it is that I am going to do, uh, you know, um, I will be interviewing 40 to 50 people, just very uh, giving a clear account of how you want to do it, right? Uh, if you're going to interview people, don't say I, I'm going to engage in an open-ended conversation with people. No, I want to interview people, uh, this amount of people, so they have an, you know, a clear sense of the range of people, uh, the place that you're going to go to to do those interview. Uh, then if you want to, then you can, you know, then put one or two words. Uh, if you think of saying, okay, the type of interviews which you want to engage in. Uh, also, every, there's always a reason for why you should get the grant. And that, like I said, a lot of this things have been spoken about already and I feel like I'm repeating myself. Uh, but you also want to end up by saying, okay, this is what it is that you are bringing or your work, not you, your work is bringing, you know, it's a gap that you, your work is filling. Are uh, you bringing a particular knowledge? Uh, but it still has to be very simple in how you write it, right? Uh, you know, it, you don't want to go engage in a technical writing. So my shock expired uh, when I did my, uh, we expired this, this, uh, yeah, this was summer because I got it for three years. I'm in my, going into my fourth year right now. Uh, so in my fourth year, I had to apply for the uh, OGS, which I just uh, received as well. Uh, the OGS, uh, to be fair, uh, is that I, someone told me uh, that, because I couldn't find a particular template to use with York. Now, the interesting thing is that York doesn't really have a template uh, because you just put it in the form. But I wrote following the template which I got from UFT, which has a particular template. But at the end of the day, it's almost felt like a waste of, you know, exercise, but I don't know if that makes, made a difference, but I make sure I follow the limited, uh, not line, you know, four, uh, four lines of sentences and so on, everything just, it's just, so I just copied and pasted everything in the same manner. So I try to fo follow, uh, you know, the, the whatever rules, uh, like uh, uh, Tsukumbo mentioned uh, in, in, on the chat here about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the can't, I can't remember what she said, but something to the effect of, you know, just a, a paragraph or the, the the line of process, which just margins for margin, for example, you know, that could make a difference. That is true, in, in, you know, in many other institutions, like I said, York made it different where you just copy everything in post, but that's fine. Uh, I will uh, assume that 
you know, uh, it also makes a difference. Uh, so yeah, so those, that's pretty much uh, what I have to add. Uh, but importantly for the part of references, it's very important that you're able to engage with your professors. And I, like I said, I know how much that has changed in my time. I, you know, and I'm saying in my time, yes, I'm that old. I know I engage with professors. It doesn't even matter what, you know, like sometimes you may, you just, it, now depend on what kind of student you are. So maybe you're a shy one, that's so fine. But you can still approach the professors and go like, you have a particular question. Sometimes you don't really have the question, but you want the professors to know you. Right, you're trying to make them relatable to. So you, you you're trying to you know not literally hold them hand, ransom, but you're trying to hold them in a place where you 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 almost become like you know so you know you try to you know balance that different between holding them ransom and you know and always bothering them all the time. But at least let them know you you have particular question after class. You may want. I have a you know particular subject that you mentioned the other time. You know, just talk about it with them for a brief moment. That makes them to get to know who you are. I can almost say that just hardly any professors who I've engaged with that who do not know me, unless I choose never to ever engage with those professors, right? And that is just the, the nature of it. So and it changes, and I, I understand how you know our word, our, our word right now, how we live uh, in uh, in isolation uh, has changed that. Uh, but uh, you know, I come from a different uh, set of experience. Uh, but anyway, that's all I will add to that point. And hopefully, if you have any questions, like most people have said, hey, I can always give you feedback one or two from my own experience uh, over the years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Um... I, we do have a Q, we're supposed to have a Q&A after, but I am going to allow Tulu to go ahead and hopefully we can get a few more minutes of your time um, so that we can actually um, just have some sort of discussion or anything that was missed. Um, but I, I know everybody's um, have a lot to say um, and th there has been so much valuable tips. So um, without further ado, Tulu. Yeah, hi. I know we're <laughs> short for time. Um, so my name's Tolu. So first, I just wanted to say thank you first for the opportunity to share a bit about my story, my journey, and also to the faculty that have spoken already, Drs. Takumbo, Sulubon, Damilola. They dropped <laughs> pieces of information that I wish I knew years ago, but only started to learn through my graduate journey. So I'm currently in the second year of my master's here at York in the clinical psychology program, also specializing in neuropsychology. And I did my bachelor's at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, and through my undergrad, I did my thesis, I went through the um, writing courses. And so that really helped to improve my writing. I didn't know that that would be useful in grad school as much as it actually is. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so it wasn't until I started my clinical psychology program that I realized the real importance of grants and scholarships, not only for the success of your research, but also for the future of your career in academia or elsewhere. Um, so I'm gonna be really quick. I just wanted to highlight some scholarships that I've been fortunate to receive because I feel like they're not featured as much or people may not know as much about them, but might be relevant to you so you can note them down. So um, I did work for a year before I started my grad program um, at Baycrest Hospital and there I was working in a lab um, and we applied for a MITAX Accelerate Fellowship. Um, and this was a joint application to MITAX for $165,000 between two other researchers and myself. Um, and this funding went towards the development of an online intervention for executive dysfunction, but it also went a long way to fund our positions in the lab. Um, so for those that don't know about MITAX, MITAX is a really good funding resource for research, industry, governmental work. Um, and then also 
You probably know about CGS, but there's also the CGS Michael Smith Foreign Study Supplement. So that is the MSFSS. This allows you to conduct research abroad for a maximum of six months. Um, I think they give about $6,000. So this past summer, I was in the other University of York in England <laughs> conducting research. So just for those that are interested in travel um, and would like a bit of support for that. So moving on to advice really quickly. Um, a lot of people have already talked about improving your writing skills. Um, just reiterating that it's really important to be able to have clear writing whenever you are submitting a research proposal. Um, because all of the scholarship applications that I've applied for and received, they all required a written research proposal and they all had to be clear. Um, and so to me, like scientific writing or academic writing comes with practice. So the more you work that muscle, the more like the better you become. And then my second piece of advice is to really capitalize on those around you specifically and to me most importantly your supervisor um, because they have prior knowledge of what these applications require they can guide your research focus they also know of niche scholarships that exist so three out of i think the five or six scholarships i've received were forwarded to me by my supervisor and they were interesting enough and i was like okay i'll apply for them and also they, they write your letters of recommendation if, if you know, you're asking them to. So it's important to really build that rapport with them. Um, there's also the Black Graduate Student Group Chat. So that exists. <laughs> um, and I know they draw up scholarship opportunities there from time to time. So that's a good place to be as well. Um, and also those, of course, that have gotten the award before. So if you connect well with them, you can even ask them to review your application before you submit it. Third, know your field and also know your research. Whatever you're proposing, don't propose work that has already been done. So <laughs> this is why literature reviews are really important, but also be reasonable with what you propose. So is it feasible in the time frame that you're proposing? Is it relevant to study that given where things stand in the literature right now? So these are just questions to ask yourself as you're submitting your proposal. Lastly, know yourself you know best if you can complete a research proposal in a month um but other than that you also need to plan ahead because it's not just you working on the proposal now you may also need to ask for a letter of reference so it's really important to start early so that you have more time to receive feedback to edit your work to really refine what it is that you've written um lord knows my my proposals have gone through so many iterations but they always end up much better than how they started. Um, and last thing I wanted to say is that to always give yourself grace. Um, what you don't see on a lot of CVs are the grants or scholarships that um, academics applied for but never got. And usually that number is much longer than the ones that they have received. So the important thing really is to not get discouraged. Um, to improve and to try again. Um, that's really the mindset that I would say to carry as you continue applying.